Tell you, I love that song, and I love being able to celebrate July 4th, don't you? Um, I wasn't going to do this. Let me share a little story with you. I was over in Romania for three months, and um, we were there on a missions trip. I was 19 years old. It was right after the fall of Ceausescu, and we got to see a lot of um, what communism does, what socialism does to a, to a country, to what lawlessness, tyranny does to a country. We lived it. We walked in food lines. We had gas lines that we had to be a part of. It, it was horrible. And it was a privilege to take the word of God to those dear people. They were so hungry and thirsty for God's word. But I'll never forget, we were on a train and we were headed from Oradia and we were going into Hungary because Hungary was just across the way. It wasn't a very far trip. And um, at the border of Romania, they would stop the train and there would be a whole bunch of guards that would come in and check your passport. And they had their dogs, they had the AK-47s, they had all the stuff and pretty serious moment. They never cracked a grin. You know what I'm saying? They never smiled. And we'd go to the next about 100 yards further and then the Hungarian group would come in and they would check and they had their dogs and they had then nobody would crack a smile. And I'll never forget, uh, my two friends and I were on the train and as we were sitting there, a guard came in and he was all decked up and he was all very serious. And he comes in, passport, you know, and we give him our American passports. And he looked at it, opened it, looked at us, looked at it, gave it back and he said, you stay here, I'll be back. And I thought, oh boy, you know, <laughs> what, what did we do this time? You know what I'm saying? Because we had already had some interesting experiences. One day I'll share with you. About 45 minutes later, he comes back in and he takes his gun off, puts it up on the thing, takes his jacket off, puts it up, sits down, and he says, tell me about America. I want to know about America. Are you really free to go where you want to go? Are you really free? And he started asking us all kinds of questions about this country. Folks, I've had the privilege of being all over the world, and I want to tell you something. There's no place like America. There's no place. Now, we worship the Lord. Yeah, amen. We're blessed. We're blessed. We have an opportunity to present the gospel. We have an opportunity to come and worship. We have an opportunity to be free and to walk in freedom. Folks, we need and must be in prayer. This election is essential, and we have got to make sure that those people running for office that we vote for that they most, the person most that we vote for is representative of biblical godly truth. That has to happen. Has to happen. Amen? All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And we just thank God for the opportunity to come and celebrate this nation, but also obviously most importantly this morning, we celebrate where true freedom really comes from. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Let's pray. Father, we love you. I thank you for this time, and I thank you for the blood of Christ. We're going to take time to remember that later on in the service, and certainly, Lord, we just thank you. We're deeply grateful for your grace. We thank you for the privilege it is to walk with you and experience you, and Lord, I thank you so much for this morning, the time together, the fellowship that we have, which is so sweet because of what you've done for us. We're brothers and sisters in Christ, and we're grateful for all that you have done on our behalf. And we do pray for our nation, Lord. We are in desperate need of prayer. Lord, I pray uh, for our leaders. Lord, I pray for this election. Lord, I pray for your people throughout this nation that we would elect people, we would vote for people, that people who love your word and are as closely aligned with Judeo-Christian ethics would be voted into office. Lord, we want to see this nation be used in a mighty way in the midst of this world. And Father, we just trust you in the midst of it all. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Use it for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I hope you had a good week. I did. Uh, it was a little surreal driving around Albuquerque with Steph. We were here uh, years ago, and, and it's just been fun. We have all these memories of our kids 
and all the different things that we would do with them and different places that we would go. And it was, it was just fun, you know. And, of course, the view of the mountain, and uh, that's always uh, really, really cool. So we have some dear friends that came to say hi, and so we're thankful for that. We're grateful that you could be here as well. Um, one thing that happened to me is I was reminded how much I can't stand juniper. Do you, do you know that? Anybody else with me on this? Uh, I went to the urgent care slash emergency room or whatever because Stephanie was looking at my eye and she was like, it's really red. <laughs> and I was like, oh, great. You know, is this pink eye? What is this? You know, what kind of, it was, didn't hurt, didn't anything like that. But I got in there and, and they were great, wonderful people. They, they took care of me, got everything squared away. They took some dye and put it in there and then they turned off all the lights and they took this little thing and they examined my eye and they said, Oh, you got some scratches on your eye. And I'm thinking, How? he said, are you allergic to anything? I said, juniper. <laughs> have, you, have you ever seen juniper, the pollen, under a microscope? Oh, my word. It looks like a ball and chain, right? The medieval ball and chains that they used to. I promise. That's what it looks like. Because I lived here before, and I looked it up because that's stuff I don't like. You know what I'm saying? And uh, so evidently that had scratched with the dry and getting accustomed to the dry and with juniper and maybe some dust, some scratches. So what did they do? They, they gave me what's uh, an ointment to put in my eye. And what does that ointment do? It soothes. It heals. It covers. It keeps from infection. Folks, the word of God soothes and heals and helps us walk with the Lord in righteousness and goodness. And I don't know where you are in your walk with the Lord today. I don't know what God's doing in your life. I don't know what the circumstances may be. But I want to encourage you something. God's grace, God's word, the Lord himself is able to soothe. He's able to heal. He's able to walk with you in a way through circumstances to give you grace in the midst of those circumstances so you can experience him afresh and experience his life, not only externally in the midst of the circumstances, but most importantly, internally, in spite of the circumstances. And I want to take a little time and look at that this morning because I think this is so essential. We have taken grace and made it into a philosophy of life instead of recognizing that grace is truly the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Last week, we looked at rooted in grace. You got to have healthy roots in order to produce fruit. You got to be attached. You got to be abiding in the vine in order for the life of Christ to come through us in order for fruit to be produced in the midst of our lives. And if we don't have that, then all we're doing is religious activity. And, and that does not honor the Lord, I promise. He's not interested in that. He doesn't really need us. There's a sign in the staff area that says, uh, may, may you do a work in Albuquerque so great that nobody can take credit for it. Right? That's a beautiful truth because the Lord is the one that deserves all the credit. We, we just kind of like to get into the light a little bit and we kind of like to be glory hounds. We like to kind of take a little bit of that glory ourselves. And the truth of the matter is we got to give it to the Lord because apart from him, we can do what? Not one thing, nothing, nothing. Rooted in grace. Today we're going to look at indwelt by grace. We're going to go on deepened in grace, walking in grace, perfected by grace, transformed by grace. If you don't get the idea of grace at the end of this, six, well, I don't know what to do to help you. You know what I'm saying? Like we, we, we love the subject of grace because it's more than just a philosophy. It's the idea of how God chose to work on our behalf, how he's working on our behalf, and how he has promised to fulfill things on our behalf. Grace is the whole picture. And ultimately, it's the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we begin to understand that, and we realize that when we see Jesus afresh, that is revival. And we get to experience his life moment by moment, day by day. It's an amazing journey. It's an amazing relationship that the Lord has provided for us through the blood of Christ. So indwelt by grace, we're going to look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 25, and kind of go to chapter 2, verse 4. This, this is an overview, okay? So that's maybe not 30,000, maybe a 15,000 foot view, but it's, it's kind of a snapshot. I just want to give you a, a bit of a picture on this. And three things this morning, the preaching of Christ, the proclamation of Christ, and the persuasion of Christ. It's essential. The Christian life is about the Lord Jesus Christ. It really is. 
It's not about religion. It's not, it's not about all the things that we tend to make it about sometimes. It's about the Lord. It's about the Lord. It's about what the Lord has done, what he's able to do in and through us. And we've got to constantly be reminded of that because we have flesh. And we're constantly in a battle between uh, that which is of the flesh and that which is of the spirit. And the Lord constantly wants to draw us into a deeper relationship with him so that we can experience him moment by moment and day by day. Well, Colossians is a fascinating study. Uh, There's two things out of this that just as a preface, Gnosticism, that's a fancy word where uh, Paul was dealing with this. You could see the Gnostics early on. And and to put this in a a very brief sense, uh, the Gnostics were all about knowledge. And what they did is they kind of separated their fleshly sinful activity from the idea of what they thought or what they believed. In other words, they compartmentalized their life. And as as, as long as you had the right ideas or what they thought were the right ideas, you could go do whatever you wanted because they separated the spirit and matter. And that's, that's a, there's a long conversation about that. But I see that in today's society. I see that impacting churches because you can go to church on Sunday and worship the Lord and say all these wonderful things and sing these wonderful songs. You can even take communion and then go live whatever way you want the rest of the week. And folks, that, that, that has nothing to do with walking with the Lord. And that's something that they were battling back then. It's something we battle today. But there's also this idea of deism, and I, this is an interesting one in our day and age because it's kind of like deism is the idea that God is way up there and he's just folding his arms and he's watching to see how good we can do. Well, I saved them and now let's see whether they're going to really live the Christian life. And oh, that gets interesting real quick. Why has the Lord Jesus Christ come to live within us? Because he alone can do through us what he knows we could never do on our own. And so deism has nothing to do with our walk with the Lord. Gnosticism, compartmentalizing our lives, our consistency in our walk from Sunday through Saturday, every day, no matter where we are, no matter who we're with, whether we're at work, whether we're here fellowshipping with one another, whether we're at home in the family, the consistency of Christ in us, the hope of glory, is essential. And we rely upon him for everything. The preaching of Christ is an amazing issue that Paul brings out here. And and to start out in verse 25 of chapter 1 in Colossians, he says, of this church, and Paul's obviously writing to the Colossian believers. He says, of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit. Now, just quickly, there's a couple things in here. First of all, Paul didn't make himself a minister. It was a calling from God. You catch that? He didn't wake up one day and say, oh man, I got a great idea, God. This is going to be so good. I've got, we had a planning meeting and me and Apollos and all the guys, we all got together and we figured it out. No, this was something God gave to him and it's something the Lord called him into. He says, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God. That word stewardship is kind of the idea of dispensation. God has a way of working in human history. And through this particular point and in this particular passage, he's talking about God's involvement through the church into the world and into the community. And he makes it very clear that he was called to be a minister, to be a servant of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, not because he came up with the idea, not because it was something that he wanted to do for God, but rather because God in his sovereign household managerial position knew that he wanted to use Paul in order to do certain things. And that's kind of an important issue. We, we receive ministry from the Lord. We, we don't tell God what we're going to do for him. We say, Lord, we don't really have a clue. There are certain things he's made clear that we ought to be doing. We need to love one another. We obviously need to love the Lord. In order for us to love one another, we need to be in a right relationship with the Lord. And we need to be listening. But in the midst of it all, when it comes to serving the Lord, we got to be rightly related to him first so that we're ready to receive from him what it is that he wants to do through us. And then we're dependent upon him in order to accomplish the work that he alone is able to accomplish, not only in our lives, but then through our lives, because ultimately it's all for his glory. He takes care of the results. I think it's an essential thing. 
Paul says of this church, I was made a minister. It wasn't because of me. It wasn't my ideas. According to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit. What a beautiful picture. I'm doing what I'm doing, not because I came up with this idea or because I want to enslave you in order to get you to do what I want you to do. I'm doing what I'm doing, and I'm telling you what I'm telling you because God called me into something, and he wants to use me in order to encourage you, and I want to serve you. It's for your benefit. It's a beautiful idea. And what does he say? So that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. And then he goes on to explain what ultimately that is. He says, that is the mystery, which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints. Wow. What an amazing, what is the preaching of the word of God? We talk about the preaching of the word of God. Well, obviously it's the sharing of the word of God here. Paul basically encapsulates all of the preaching of the word of God and makes it about one thing, Christ. It's all about Christ. It's all about him. (laughs) I don't care what passage you want to go to, and I don't care where you want to land. I don't care whether it's in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Ultimately, it's going to point to the Lord Jesus Christ because the Lord Jesus Christ is what the preaching of the word of God is all about. And Paul makes that very, very clear. He says, the mystery, which has been hidden, the word mystery there is the idea of something that God himself alone knows about and alone can disclose. He can alone bring it to light. We could never figure this out on our own. The mystery, which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested, brought to light to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is what? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Wow. Think about that. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not Christ next to you. Christ in you. Think about that. I don't know when you've been hit with the truth that the Lord Jesus Christ himself indwells you. Can you remember a moment where you suddenly had a recognition and a realization of that in a way that was profound? I can. I was down in Florida. I had already been saved. Amen? And, and I was praying. I was actually going to be preaching at a, at a, a small kind of a uh, setting for some uh, church members and some people. It was a conf- small conference. And I was preparing for this, and I was, I was on my bed, and I was, before bed, I was looking over my notes, and I was just praying about it, and I was reading about it, and this idea came to me, and suddenly, for whatever reasons, at that particular moment, the Lord impressed upon me something fresh about the reality that the Lord Jesus Christ himself lives within me. And I want to tell you something. It, it blew my mind. It's hard to wrap your mind around that. Jesus Christ lives in me. Christ in me. The resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, living his life in me. The hope, the assurance, future faith with regard to what he's promised me. Folks, think about that. As we walk and no matter where we go, no matter who we come in contact with, when we're believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and we've been saved, we are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And by the grace of God, he has come to live his life in and through us. And Paul speaks to the issue of the preaching of Christ and he boils it down to one basic thing that is a foundation to everything, which is Christ in me, the hope of glory. Have you been hit by that lately? Have you been overwhelmed by that truth lately? Folks, that's a, it's an amazing truth. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And when we begin to walk with him and experience him, it doesn't matter what somebody else does to you. It doesn't matter what the circumstances may be. It doesn't matter what. We know that our heavenly father is watching over us. We know that the promise that he's made is that he's going to bring good out of those things which take place in our lives for his glory, for his honor, because he's constantly working to conform us to the very image of Christ. And as we yield to him and experience him afresh, the Lord Jesus Christ begins to do that work where he begins to produce his fruit, love, through our lives. And guess what? Against love, there is no law. In other words, when I yield to the Lord Jesus Christ and I walk with him and he begins to produce the fruit of the spirit, which is love through me, then I'm walking according to his righteous standard. 
in every area of my life. Is it any wonder that Paul constantly spoke of the issue of grace and constantly spoke of the issue of the Lord Jesus Christ and what it is that he's done for us. He says, the preaching of Christ. I want to make this known to you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Well, there's the proclamation of Christ. He goes on in verse 28, he says, we proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. That idea of proclaim is simply to announce to announce to everybody, right? He's an apostle. He was called with a specific message, which is what the word apostle means. He went to people who had never heard about the Lord, or maybe they had heard about the Lord, but they needed to be strengthened in who the person of the Lord Jesus Christ is and what he's able to do in and through their lives. And he began to establish churches and he helped set up elders and he began to do all the things that as the apostle Paul was called to do that he was, that he was doing. And it's amazing when you look at what he talks about in terms of proclaiming him. We proclaim him. We're we're announcing him. Christ in you, the hope of glory. We announce him. Why? Because we want to admonish every man. We want them to understand what it means to walk with God. We want them to be corrected in their thinking with regard to how to live life. We admonish every man. We teach every man with all wisdom, the wisdom that comes from God. Remember, this is something that God revealed. It's not something we could ever figure out. It's not religious thinking. It's not because I've got a bunch of letters after my name. It's because God made it known. Because only God can make it known. Every man with all wisdom What's the point? So that we may present every man complete in Christ. Wow. That word complete means mature. Mature. Telios. It has the idea of finished. Now, what do we mean? Do do we mean that we're never going to sin again? We're never going to struggle with sin? No, no, no. What he's talking about is we recognize the truth of Christ in us, the hope of glory, and we recognize how to walk with the Lord, that he's everything to us. And when we have a struggle with our sin, which Paul himself had, the apostle John himself had, if we confess our sin, right? They had struggle with sin as well. But what did they learn? What did they know to do? Run to Christ. Run to the Lord, because they knew that the Lord alone was able to overcome their sin. That's the idea of maturity, right? The the mature through practice, the writer of Hebrews tells us, the mature through practice have their senses trained to discern, distinguish. Through practice, it takes time. What is good, meaning what is of God? What is evil, meaning what's of my flesh? And the Lord himself begins to teach us that. God begins to instruct us in this. We proclaim him. We announce him. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Admonishing every man, teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete, mature in Christ. And he says, for this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Now, that's a loaded statement, and I don't have time to unpack all that. There's, there's like four different words for strength used in that particular verse. It's amazing. But the idea is that Paul says, I'm putting everything I got into this, but it's according to the power of God in me. In other words, there's a, there's a relationship with the Lord. God indwells me. Christ indwells me. I have his grace to transform me and then to empower me to do the very things that he has called me to do. Now, has anybody ever wrestled? Because the one word here is for wrestling. I saw, I saw kind of like a shorthand kind of moment. You know, wrestling is tough. I played all the sp- I played, I wrestled, I played basketball, I played baseball. I, I love baseball. Baseball, I love. I love baseball. Baseball's great. I hope you're going to the Isotopes game. You need to go to the Isotopes game. Go to the Isotopes game. Carrie's sitting out there every, every week that I've been here, which is only two, but I've seen her every week that I've been here, and she's collecting money for the Isotopes. Go to the Isotopes game. If you hadn't signed up, sign up. But anyway, the point is, is I, I love uh, wrestling. I love basketball. Wrestling's probably physically the most difficult. And one year, I don't know what my dad was thinking, but he allowed me to wrestle and play basketball in the same season. 
And I, I, was, I was, at that time, I was a little bit of a chunky guy, and that's kind of why I think he wanted me to do this, right? I was a big guy. I was the heavyweight on the wrestling team, and it was, I think it was like ninth grade. So we went, and we had this wrestling match, and I can still remember my brother because my brother was on the team, and I remember the whole wrestling team screaming at the top of their lungs because all this other uh, lug and myself were doing is trying to outmuscle our, so each one another. You know what I'm saying? Like, we, we didn't know how to do the moves. I didn't know how to do the single leg takedown very good, double leg takedown. I didn't know how to do the headlocks very well. I didn't know any of that stuff. All I knew was I was trying to get this guy on his back, and he was trying to get me on my back, and so we just back and forth, and I could still see my brother over in the corner screaming at the top of his lungs, single leg takedown, single leg takedown. He was yelling at me to do this, right? Because the kid was standing up and I was standing up. Neither of us were getting low. And my arms were getting more and more tired as we went through this match. Now, thankfully, by the third quarter, I kind of had a, a, a brain moment. You know, it was like, ha ha, this is not working. I'm getting tired. I need to do something different. And so I took the guy down, and the whole place erupted and went crazy, and then I was able to wrestle him onto his back, and I pinned him, and the guy slammed his, and I, and I, oh, I couldn't move my arms. I literally couldn't move my arms. I went to basketball practice 20 minutes later. <laughs> it's true, I did. It was really hilarious. I went to my coach. The lactic acid had, had just gone. I, I couldn't move my arms. And the coach looked at me. He goes, what's wrong with you? I said, I just had a wrestling match. He's like, well, that's the, whatever. You got to run now. And so I did. I did all my running, and it came time to shoot free throws. And I was like, I, I couldn't do it. <laughs> I'm not going to try to act like what I, I look like. I don't even know what I look like. I just know what it felt like. The idea that Paul is giving here, the idea of laboring, the idea of weary energy, of pouring everything you got into something, but understanding that the power ultimately comes from the Lord is a beautiful picture. Paul's basically saying, I didn't leave anything out. I put everything I got into this. But then he says, but it's the power of God in me. Now, folks, that's an amazing truth because we can grow weary. We can physically get tired. We can emotionally get tired. But spiritually, we're on fire because it's from the Lord, because God continues to give us the strength that we need in order to do the things that he has called us to do. And how does that happen? Because Christ lives in me, and it's all by his grace. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Well, lastly, I'm not going to go to Ephesians 4. You can look at that, verses 11 through 16. It's phenomenal. It talks about the sufficiency of God's word in order to build up the body of Christ. But the persuasion of Christ, and I'm going to start with verse 4. I know that 1, 2, and 3 come before verse 4. Believe me, I understand that, okay? But look at verse 4. First, he says, I say this. What does he say? Verses one through three. I say this so that no one will delude you. Has the idea of giving you some kind of a thought, reasoning logically something that is close to the truth, but it's not actually the truth. I say this so that no one will delude you with what? Persuasive argument, argument or speech, logic, that sounds right to the human thinking, but it's not from God. It's close. It sounds good, but it's not exactly right. And Paul says, I'm telling you this because I don't want you to be deluded. I don't want you to be fooled by persuasive arguments that sound good, but actually have nothing to do with Christ in you, the hope of glory, with the grace of God who's able to transform you from the inside out. And this is where verses 1 through 3 come in. He says, I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf and for those who are at Laodicea and for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged 
In other words, that they, the Lord would come alongside of them. They would experience the love of God in such a way that they were knit together as a body of believers. They were brought together in a way that they were inseparable in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery that is Christ himself. And what is in Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of of wisdom and knowledge. Whoa, wait, wait, what? See, this is the idea, and he is attacking the Gnostics on this because he's saying this is a knowledge that only God can reveal, and guess what? He has revealed it, and it's available to everybody who desires to yield to the Lord Jesus Christ, and God will make it known to you. It's not some secretive thing. It's out in front. It's out in the open. Then you have an opportunity to walk with the Lord. And guess what? In Christ are all the treasures, all the riches of wisdom and knowledge. Wow. Think about that. Folks, are we walking in light of that? Are we walking through life with that understanding? Paul says, I don't want you to be deluded. Don't get caught up in persuasive arguments that sound right, that are very close to the truth, but actually really aren't the truth at all and are actually the most dangerous things. If I started to preach to you and I started to say that the virgin birth is nonsense, you would immediately know it. You would be like, whoa, we got a problem. This pastor we just got, what's up with this guy? There'd be meetings all over the place because that's as false doctrine as you can get, right? But what happens when we start to do what the Galatian believers do? They start to nullify. They start to set aside the grace of God and they start to make it about what they could do for God instead of what God is able to do in and through us. What about that? I want to tell you something. That's actually a little bit more dangerous on one level because it, it gets in. People start to buy into that and it becomes about flesh and it becomes about spiritual pride. It has nothing to do with Christ. It has nothing to do with the Spirit of God empowering us. And all of a sudden, we're functioning out of our own thinking instead of yielding to the Lord and walking with Him. Folks, Christ in you the hope of glory, the assurance of what God has done, what God alone can do, the maturity of recognizing through practice and training and circumstances and all kinds of situations of running to the Lord and recognizing that I have everything in him that I need, that Christ indwells me. Grace is a part of the very fabric of who I am as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't have to just look back at grace wishing that somehow I could experience experience it afresh. I can experience God's grace today when I see him afresh and I can walk with the Lord and be empowered and strengthened by the Lord. And whatever you're going through, whatever the circumstances may be, understand you are not sufficient for those circumstances, but the Lord Jesus Christ is. And when you yield to him and you begin to experience him, God in you, will begin to transform you, mature you, make you complete in him with the understanding what, what that really means, which is that I'm going to run to him because he alone knows how to do this. He does this best. Look, was, as we walk the Christian life, as we're commanded to do certain things in Scripture, as we're commanded not to do certain things in Scripture, Understand that the Holy Spirit dwells within me in order to accomplish either what I shouldn't do and give me the strength to do what I ought to do, or he gives me the strength to do what I ought to do as I yield to him. Why? Because God's grace is sufficient. The Lord Jesus Christ himself has come to take up residence in my life, and he's the great shepherd. He will lead. He will guide. He will direct. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. What a beautiful life we have to walk with our Lord. And folks, we didn't do a thing to deserve it, and we can't do a thing to pay God back for what he has done. That's why we take time to remember and we say, thank you, Lord, 
for the blood of Christ. Thank you for the body at the cross. This unbelievable, horrifically glorious picture of the goodness of God reaching out to us that even while we were yet sinners, what did Christ do? He died for us. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads with me for a moment? Kim's going to come and we're going to just...